We have the ability to recruit uh, amazing talent. We do this happiness exercise. I'm like, literally take out your notebook. Making sure that they're the right fit for the culture. This sort of safe space to be vulnerable. Our products bring comfort, enjoyment. Bratty, kind of out of touch humor. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back, would you send this can to this one person again? I have yet to meet uh, someone from St. Louis that isn't proud uh, of Anheuser-Busch. And I think that that's something that we need to cherish and not just take for granted. Brendan Whitworth, CEO of Anheuser-Busch AB, which brews Bud Light, said this in June 2022 before the major backlash. Why is it that this comment has aged so badly? And why is it that his mission statements don't entirely correspond to reality, to say the least? Let's find out. Welcome to the channel where we look at what influential people say, what they really say. Subscribe for more videos. Welcome aboard. The Bud Light controversy is a case study in the difference between brand identity, how the company wants to be perceived, and brand image, how the company is actually perceived. Whitworth uses the right words, but reality is oftentimes much different than the alleged good intentions that a CEO might have. This is a case study in branding gone wrong. So we have to continue to um, you know, help reinforce that. Part of that is being who we are. And who is that exactly? Last year, Whitworth spoke assertively as if he already knew. This year, after the backlash, he spoke as if he'd just found out who they were. Um, when you say listening, you know, I've been out to many of the impacted markets. My team has been out to many of the impacted markets. And over the last month, we've talked to over 100,000 consumers and their feedback is very clear. What is it? The feedback is to reinforce what Bud Light has always meant to them, which is good times, goodwill, and easy enjoyment. And we have that all packed inside of our summer campaign that we launched last week. Now, suddenly, it's about good times and easy enjoyment. How convenient. In terms of branding, once the damage is done, it's too late for this, because with his actions, the ad campaign he greenlighted, he showed that to him, it wasn't just about good times and easy enjoyment. When we compare these two passages, we learn two things. One, that his strategy isn't a real comeback strategy, it's a hope strategy. And two, that he didn't know who they were in this conversation from last year, because obviously he didn't know enough to avoid the predictable backlash. This goes to show that CEOs can look confident and speak assertively, and not have sufficient knowledge about the core consumer. And when the target audience feels left out, they'll stop buying your product. It's very simple, yet CEOs forget this all the time, especially today, favoring political and ideological messages instead. A thing I find interesting is how he presents the good times and easy enjoyment as a revelation, when the fact is that he spoke about it before the backlash. But then we also, like I mentioned, understood a lot about the consumer. So we've now followed the consumer through the journey of where we are right now, and we still find that our products bring comfort, enjoyment uh, when people, especially when people get together. However, there are self-serving incentives for Whitworth to present it as a revelation. And over the last month, we've talked to over 100,000 consumers and their feedback is very clear. As part of the alleged comeback plan to make the target audience like the company again. The image people have of a company is most times dependent on the image they have of the company's CEO. The CEO is the face of the company, just like the vice president of marketing is the face of the company. First, he establishes his ethos, appeal to competence and credibility. How AB reached out to him. So what's your favorite beer? Let's get out of the way. It's easy, it's Budweiser. There you so, go. So uh, King of Beers, honestly, it, it predated my, uh, my, even my employment and is uh, a reason why I took a, a call from a recruiter when I was very happily working at PepsiCo uh, was because of Budweiser and then my affinity for Anheuser-Busch, so. After the backlash, it was obviously important for him to stress this ethos with a little help from his friends at CBS. Brendan, we should point out that you're a former United States Marine and you were also at the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Correct. Actually, they shouldn't mention it. They mention it because it advertises for his competencies. Listen to this. The highest calling that anybody can have is serving the country. Uh, but for you know, personal reasons, made the decision after eight years in service of the country 
to, to move into, into business. I worked for PepsiCo for a number of years and I came here 10 years ago and I've been in this position for two years. No, officially, this isn't an ad campaign. It's a monologue, which they call an interview, an interview which in light of the backlash should have been critical. Instead, he's given the chance to appeal to so-called national ethos, which is a prominent element in speeches, particularly presidential speeches, as it appeals to people's emotion. It's a way to make audiences focus on community rather than the wrongdoings of the speaker, turning a negative into a positive, so to speak. Uh -huh. And it really is, as I mentioned, an American institution. And it's really, to me, one degree of separation away from the United States, the, the American flag. And so even though I'm not serving the country anymore, I still feel like I have an opportunity uh, to support the, the country. And that's exactly what Anheuser-Busch gives us the opportunity to do. Right, so, people love Bud Light. The, the adverb the anymore is a presupposition, presupposing that he has served the country, which again is an appeal to people to focus on that rather than his wrongdoings. Also, we should ask the question, what does it even matter that he served the country? What does that have to do with brewing beer? Nothing. He says it, and is allowed to say it, because this is advertising, trying to make the brand popular again no matter how exaggerated and contrived the advertising seems. The first step is to make the CEO popular again. As I mentioned, the CEO is the face of the company. And yes, the vice president of marketing too. The With his laughter, we flag. can't be sure that he believes this either. This narrative is part of his script. As we see next, he repeated it before the backlash too. In the following, notice how skilled he is at repeating a certain word with positive connotations, without ever being specific about what it means. In this case, the word passion and variations of it. You know, I think one of our special sauces, if you will, is passion. Um, I try to bring it to work every day. Uh, I never thought I would be in business, ever. It's an accident um, that I'm in business, honestly. Um, but I never thought I'd get back um, elements of passion that I had serving the country. But I mean, if you look at Anheuser-Busch, for me, um, you know, it's one degree of separation from the American flag. I enjoy bringing that to work every day because I feel very passionate about the brands, very passionate about the company and still feel in some strange way I'm serving my country. And I think our folks bring that to work every day as well um, because of Anheuser-Busch and uh, because of the passion for the brands. Anyone can be passionate about what they do. That's why in a job application, when someone writes that they're passionate, it doesn't tell us anything about the person. Passion isn't a substitute for making the right decisions in terms of recruitment and ideas for ad campaigns. Experience is what counts, and not necessarily business experience first and foremost, but experience with the target audience. Because just like it's crucial that the target audience is able to identify themselves with the brand, it's crucial that executives are able to identify themselves with the target audience. The latter part is often overlooked or ignored. Yeah, I think the, uh, when you think that the company's been around for 170 years, it's, it's humbling to have the opportunity to, to support and to, to lead Anheuser-Busch. So, I mean, first and foremost, I, I bring that humility into to what I'm trying to do and sort of how I'm trying to support you know, our total business and the 19,000 employees that we have in the U.S. Alyssa Heinerscheid, Vice President of Marketing for Bud Light, also used the word humbling. Being the first woman to lead Bud Light, the biggest beer brand kind of in the world, it's, it's been, it's humbling. And I'm incredibly grateful. It's taken kind of 41 years for a woman to be in this spot. and But that's the point. They can say the words, but their actions point to a different truth. And in Heinerscheid's case, even subsequent statements point to a different truth. Bud Light had been kind of a brand of fratty, kind of out of touch humor. And it was really important <laughs> that we had another approach. So this isn't humility, it's distance taking. She's distancing herself and by extension the company from the target audience. That's why when people describe themselves as humble, inclusive or tolerant, we should be alert because it's often or most times overcompensation. Because deep down these people know that they're actually not that humble, inclusive or tolerant. His talk about humility resembles his talk about the consumers after the backlash. Notice how he evades and is allowed to evade the question. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back, would you send this can to this one person again? There's a, a big social conversation 
taking place right now, and big brands are right in the middle of it. And it's not just our industry or Bud Light. It's happening in retail, it's happening in fast food. And so for us, what we need to understand is, deeply understand and appreciate is the consumer and what they want, what, what they care about, and what they expect from, from big brands. So this is a part of why you're getting it from all sides. And that's the thing, obviously, they didn't understand and appreciate the core consumer, and they still don't. Not only because the company hasn't commented on Heinerscheid's remarks in her disastrous interview, but also because he evades a direct question in such an obvious fashion. Saying that he understands and appreciates the target audience is easy, and doesn't require him to take responsibility. Also, of course, companies should understand and appreciate their consumers. That's so obvious that it doesn't need to be said, let alone be delivered as a revelation. So this is nothing more than advertising in an attempt to disguise that they actually didn't and still don't understand their consumers. Next, things get unintentionally funny as he talks about recruitment. Um, you know, I think with a, a company that is as storied and has as much history as Anheuser-Busch does, you know, we have the ability to recruit uh, amazing talent and we're very deliberate about it in terms of who we bring in, making sure that they're the right fit for the culture of, of how we do business. Um, this passage has proved that there doesn't have to be a correlation between a CEO's words and reality. Because in reality, who was this amazing talent that was the right fit for the culture? whatever this culture is. My husband bought this swag chain, oh. uh, which is hilarious. <laughs> it says Team Heinerscheid swag chain. I took this fabulous class in college and it was called happiness. Our only job was to try to pause when we were feeling really happy and just jot down why and be more conscious of what are the things that make you happy? What are the mm -hmm. things that bring you joy? Yeah. We do this happiness exercise. I'm like, literally take out your notebook you're going to give every day for two weeks a grade. You're going to say one, really unhappy, two, medium happy, three, happy. Is this the right fit? An employee who's obviously more concerned with her own well-being than the well-being of the company and teaches her teams to have the same mindset. Happiness exercises that have no place in a major corporation teach employees to listen to their own fleeting emotions rather than the everlasting principles of basic branding, keeping the brand heritage and target audience in mind. You can't have one brand personality that consumers can identify themselves with when you have multiple personalities because of all the different emotions and vulnerabilities of your employees. We have to create these spaces and those that's yeah. sort of the vibe, you know, that I try to bring to my family and to my teens, this sort of safe space to be vulnerable. And, and those folks is who, are who we depend on to, to really run the business. Um, and with that, we put innovation front and center and make sure that they have the freedom and the, and the, the autonomy and the sort of the empowerment um, to do things differently, whether that be on brands or whether that be on how we choose to enable the business on a variety of different things. A variety of different things. How specific? It totally doesn't sound like something you say when you don't have something to say. But the buzzword empowerment. empowerment, Whitworth again knows which terms to use in order to sound like a modern leader. As a word, empowerment has become an excuse for bad decisions. For example, if producers know that yet another Hollywood movie is bad, they can say, this movie is empowering to audiences. And when it inevitably fails, people just aren't ready for this level of empowerment. It's interesting how movies that are actually good don't rely on platitudes like empowerment, inclusion and representation for marketing. However, empowerment doesn't excuse the fact that Heinerscheid was allowed to make statements and a campaign directly opposed to the brand heritage and thus target audience, and that he, as a CEO, greenlighted it. Empowerment means nothing in that regard. We weren't good at innovating and, and changing what we do and seeing trends and matching trends and working differently, then there's no chance that we would be still here today. Innovation, another buzzword which means nothing without context. The two things Whitworth praises here, innovation and matching trends, are exactly why the brand is now in decline, to say the least. This goes to show that memorizing new management speak isn't enough. You have to be able to communicate with your target audience, not as a tactic, but because you actually can and will communicate with them.
You can learn appreciation by reading a book or taking a management course. With this knowledge, what a great choice it was to make Heinerscheid responsible for marketing, someone who's a walking handbook in platitudes. What, do, what does evolve and elevate mean? It means inclusivity. It means shifting the tone. It means having a campaign that's truly inclusive and feels lighter and brighter. And representation is at sort of the heart of evolution. Amazing talent. Tell me, what color is the sky in your world? <laughs> Final question for me. What's your vision for keeping AB near and dear to people's hearts. We love your products, how are you gonna keep that going? This question is only one and a half years old, but we're still able to say that it's aged badly. This is a cautionary tale for all companies, that the line between success and failure is thin. Therefore, you must rely on tested employees, particularly in the marketing department. Employees who talk and act normal first and foremost, and who actually appreciate the core consumers. Spewing out buzzwords and platitudes is a red flag. It's also a red flag when a vice president is only interested in one demographic, the demographic that isn't your target audience. Super Bowl spot, fast forward. I cast an incredible female choreographer who just brought incredibly positive, amazing energy to the spot. We cast Miles Teller and his wife, Kelly Teller, but it was really crucial to me that if you see that spot, Kelly is, Kelly is the heartbeat of that spot. You're seeing this whole experience through Kelly. She's the beating heart. She, I would sort of argue, is sort of what propels you through that experience, and, and that was intentional. Hanishad show was fast to emphasize that Kelly was the main focus and not Miles, because these are the kinds of things that the target audience really cares about. We love your products. How are you going to keep that going? Yeah, it's great. Um, continue to understand the consumer. What else? Hopefully something innovative too. Um, continue to bring new, innovative, and premium products um, to the category, leveraging our capabilities. So leaning strategically and deliberately um, into, that, into that opportunity as well. Terrific. Yes, just terrific. New management speak is the best, and it's certainly been great for Budweiser. Happiness exercises and painfully obvious deceptive platitudes lead the way. The Bud Light disaster is an important case study. It shows what happens when ideology or politics, mixed with new management terms, are at the forefront, rather than the consumer that both Whitworth and Heinerschei keep talking about and appealing to, but have little understanding and appreciation of. So little, in fact, that Whitworth tried his best to evade responsibility. Just to be clear, it was uh, it was a gift, um, and it won and it was uh, and it was one can. We have to understand um, the impact that it's had, and like I said, you know uh, that that impact has has taken place. One thing that I'd love to make extremely clear uh, is that impact is my responsibility, uh, and as the CEO, everything we do here, I'm accountable for. Of course, he's accountable. He's the CEO. He's stating the obvious again. However, as a CEO, you don't show that you're accountable by saying that you're accountable. Accountability means commenting on campaign decisions and the disastrous statements of the vice president. And the target audience doesn't see that. The target audience sees a CEO who's seeking to minimize his wrongdoing and evade questions. Just to be clear, it was, uh, it was a gift um, and, it won and, it was, uh, and it was one can. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back, would you send this can to this one person again? There's a, a big social conversation taking place right now in big brands. That's not accountability taking. You can talk about understanding and appreciation till the cows come home. Words mean nothing without sincerity and action. Today, executives are so busy trying to sound good that they forget what's actually good for their brand and product. And Bud Light is still paying the price for that. You know, we have the ability to recruit uh, amazing talent making sure that they're the right fit for the culture. And I want to share with you something that I heard, probably the most impactful piece of advice I've ever heard. I heard the CMO of GE, this woman, Beth Comstock. Mm -hmm. I've seen her speak and I she heard her is speak. amazing. 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 So, and so she had this fantastic answer. She talked about faking it. Number one, mm -hmm. she was like, I fake it all the time. And you realize the more senior you get, everybody's faking it. And it's so <laughs> true. Everyone doesn't really know what they're talking about. See you next time.